You know, there's always been something that's bothered me. Why do American and German cars look so different? I mean, sure, cities here are a lot denser and our roads are quite a bit tighter. But that's mostly in the old city centers where cars are largely not even allowed anymore these days. And yeah, gasoline here in Germany is more expensive. But the average American commute is four times of the average German. So arguably, fuel economy should be just as significant. And to be honest, I have never seen a country more obsessed with towing things, from campers to utility trailers, than here in Germany. And they do it all with standard sized cars. So why is it then that when we have pretty similar family sizes, and when we have pretty similar uses for our vehicles, why do Americans overwhelmingly opt for vehicles that look like this, while Germans choose to buy vehicles that look like this? Well, let's take a look. In a couple of videos now, we have discussed the culture shocks that we've experienced driving in Germany. From racing down the Autobahn to meticulously inspecting our vehicles with TÜV, these are topics that are definitely new and exciting for us as Americans. But that experience behind the wheel is really only one small piece of the puzzle in really understanding the differences in car culture and car design between the United States and Germany. In the United States, car culture is deeply ingrained in society and holds a significant place in the American identity. The vastness of our country, extensive road networks, and a historically strong automotive industry have all contributed to a car-centric lifestyle. And American car culture often emphasizes this idea of freedom, personal identity, and adventure that are all tied to the automobile. It's common to see large, powerful vehicles such as pickup trucks and SUVs on American roads. But in contrast, Germany has a long-standing reputation for engineering excellence and precision in the automotive industry. German car culture is characterized by a deep appreciation for high-quality craftsmanship, performance, and technology. And you see that in the kind of cars that are regularly driven, with the prioritization of, again, precision, efficiency, and driving dynamics. They value luxury brands such as BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Audi, which are renowned for their engineering prowess. And Germany is home to several iconic racetracks, including the Nürburgring, and motorsports play a crucial role in the culture. But if the sentiment holds true that we are what we eat, perhaps our respective cultures can also be illuminated by the kind of automobiles that the consumers consume. Buyers express their personalities through their choice of mark, model, and features, not to mention their desires, their private circumstances, and often also the scope of their budget and discretionary funds. Our preferences on automobiles are also physical, and have a ripple effect on so many aspects of our everyday lives. It shapes our cities, roads, and our proclivity to forego the car altogether and favor public transit investments. It changes the way our homes look. It changes the way we shop. But it also gives subtle clues on what's going on behind the scenes too. The cost of fuel and how the government regulates or doesn't regulate private industry, and carbon emissions. And you know, I think the best way to start this conversation is just to simply take a look at the kind of cars our consumers prefer to purchase. Here in Germany, the Volkswagen Golf has been the best-selling car model for every calendar year since 1981. And this is somewhat unsurprising because Volkswagen quite literally translates to the people's car and they've been the largest car maker in Germany, selling 8.7 million vehicles just last year in 2022. 
And although Volkswagen is definitely a very traditional German brand, they're also a global car company and one of the biggest players in the automobile industry. According to a study published by the German think tank Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in 2018, over half of passenger vehicles destined for Europe and almost two thirds of all luxury cars sold worldwide were German designed. And when we take a look at the top 10 vehicles sold in Germany, we can see that Germans do love their German cars. In fact, 14 of the top 20 vehicles sold last year in Germany were German brands. But on the other side of the pond, when it comes to the kind of cars that Americans prefer to get in a committed vehicular relationship with, you know, it's pickup trucks that really sets our hearts aflutter. Turns out things like towing capacity and payload can really get the motor running. Trucks represent about 20% of US sales this year, a tad more than cars. In fact, pickup trucks, whether it's the Ford F-Series, the Chevy Silverado, and the Ram pickup, account for three of the five best-selling vehicles this year. And this doesn't even take into account the car or truck-based SUVs. Taken all together, these vehicles now make up seven out of 10 American vehicle sales, but the undisputed king of the road, with one sold every 49 seconds, is the Ford F-Series truck. It's the most popular vehicle in the United States and has been for 41 straight years. And as a Midwestern girl whose dad is a farmer, this is completely unsurprising to me. Although I should probably mention, uh, my dad prefers the Chevy Silverado. Sorry, Ford. But I grew up in farm country and pickup trucks are simply a way of life there. They're a tool of our trade. But that being said, the vast majority of people who own a pickup truck in the United States don't actually need one. I mean, there have been numerous studies that show that the majority of pickup truck owners aren't hauling construction equipment or landscaping supplies. They're simply using it to haul their suit and tie butts to work. But listen, I'm not here to stand on that particular soapbox, at least not today. If you're looking for a much more in-depth look into the evolution and psychology behind America's love affair with pickup trucks and SUVs, I'm gonna link to a video from one of my favorite YouTubers, Not Just Bikes, down below. He does an amazing job of breaking down the trajectory of American car consumption and the pitfalls that we face when supersizing our SUVs from both a safety and social perspective. But I think the most important takeaway that I had from that video, and one that I think is probably the most important when you're doing a cross country cultural comparison, is that a lot of the differences in our automobiles boils down to just plain differences in government regulation or lack thereof. Because yeah, I think one of the most overlooked reasons for the difference in vehicles between the US and Germany is government regulation. And to be honest, it's easy to understand why most people don't think of regulation as being a major determinant. After all, car sales are global, right? You'd think that this process of standardization is universal, but the truth is that automotive safety standards can differ based off of geographic location. For example, American-made automobiles are not held to the same safety standard for pedestrian safety as European cars. And that can lead to pretty dramatic differences in their overall design. European automobile manufacturers must construct their cars under oversight from the European Union. Notably, the general safety regulation actually requires automobile manufacturers to make pedestrian safety protocols mandatory for all vehicles by addressing pedestrians and cyclist specific concerns. And in regards to design, this is implemented in a few notable ways that differ from American cars, such as hood distance, raised front seats, smaller wheels, and an emphasis on reducing impact severity on the legs and head through softer materials, inside bumpers like foam, and crushable plastics. So that's in part why the Ford Escape looks like this in the United States, while the Ford EcoSport the European version of the same vehicle 
looks like this. You can see that not only is the hood shorter, but it's sloped down to give the driver better visibility for potential pedestrians in front of them. Now, while in the EU, by and large, their car safety standards are all based on the United Nations research and recommendations. The American safety standards are actually based by US regulatory bodies. And ultimately, the framework that they've developed specifies just three domains of testing for meeting their regulatory requirements, crash avoidance, crash worthiness, and post-crash survivability. Don't get me wrong, these are all very important things. But again, the big difference here is that the US framework is primarily, in fact, almost exclusively interested in how well the occupants of the car survive a crash and give very little, if really any, consideration to the people outside of the car. And this is important because pedestrian deaths on American roads have gone up by more than 50% in a decade. And although the reason behind this is complex, data shows that drivers of pickups, minivans, large vans, and SUVs are all more likely to hit a pedestrian than a car. So given the fact that during the same time period, the purchase of those same SUVs, minivans, and trucks has gone up, while the purchase of cars has gone down, well, this kind of result is tragic, but not necessarily hard to believe. And here's something else that is also really shocking. The European New Car Assessment Program, or the Euro NCAP, is a European voluntary car safety performance assessment program based in Belgium. And every year they release their list of the safest family car. In 2022, the Tesla Model Y took the top spot. But although Tesla is an American brand, it's not entirely genuine to take that ranking as proof that American cars are safe in their totality. Because as an EV, it is held to a much, much higher safety regulation than the average internal combustion engine vehicle. In fact, EVs are regularly given the highest possible safety rating in crash tests by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration thanks to the external aluminum plating surrounding its battery array and the extra layer of fire protection between its batteries and passengers. So if you take Tesla out of the equation, the next American-made family vehicle, when ranked by European standards, comes in 49th place in terms of safety. And maybe we shouldn't be so surprised. After all, American-made vehicles have a much higher recall rate than their competitors. And in addition to this, the seriousness of those recalls is generally higher for American-made cars. And you know, speaking of regulation, this idea that we should have some kind of oversight to ensure both fairness and quality of course, this doesn't just end with safety. When it comes to automobiles, the government, both in the US and in Germany, regulates almost every facet of our interaction with them because they're dangerous and require a certain level of responsibility. But one of the things that I find is often less talked about, but is extremely important in understanding why cars look so different between Germany and the United States all kind of comes down to how those cars are taxed in each country. And the long story short, taxes are higher on cars in Germany. Now, I'm not going to get into the weeds today on specific calculations and loopholes and caveats on how you pay taxes on your car, because quite frankly, how much you pay in taxes and how you pay those taxes varies greatly depending on where you live. But if you keep things simple with just looking at the purchase of a new car for private use, the sales tax and property taxes that we would pay in the US on average doesn't even amount to half of what sales tax alone is here in Germany. 
And here's the really interesting bit. In the US, all of those taxes are calculated as a percentage of the monetary value of the vehicle. And sometimes there's a fancy little calculation done on the weight of the vehicle, but again, that's somewhat niche. But in Germany, in lieu of property tax, we pay a motor vehicle tax that has nothing to do with the purchase price of the vehicle at all. The calculation of motor vehicle tax is based on just two main components, CO2 emissions and engine size. And in short, car owners of vehicles with high CO2 emissions will be taxed more heavily, while the owners of climate-friendly cars will be rewarded with an annual tax bonus of 30 euros. And Electric vehicles are actually motor tax vehicle exempt. Plus, several of Germany's major cities have introduced environmental green zones, where every vehicle is assigned a badge called an Umweltplakette, denoting how heavily polluting the vehicle is according to European emission standards. And yes, because I would be lambasted in the comment section if I didn't include it, yes, gasoline is more expensive here in Germany. You can watch an entire video we made on this subject here, but for our American viewers, please know, it's not because your oil is cheaper. <laughs> oil is traded on a global market, so the difference of the price at the pump essentially comes down to, well, you guessed it, taxes. And these four things together, higher sales tax, which significantly ups the price up front, the motor vehicle tax that acts as a long-term disincentive for German drivers from purchasing expensive, heavy, big engine behemoths, the environmental green zones that restrict where you're able to drive in the first place, and the high cost to fill up the tank are all huge reasons why you don't see big trucks like this driving around Germany. Okay, so you know, I kind of want to switch gears here a little bit. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay. All right. All right. Enough, enough, enough. Now at the very beginning of this video, I acknowledge that there are of course some pretty plainly obvious reasons why cars have historically been smaller in Europe. Older city centers here are simply a lot more dense and twisty than American cities. In general, the distance traveled was less on your average commute. But honestly, drive through most newer developments in Europe, really anything constructed in the 20th century, and you'll find that the infrastructure is scaled pretty similarly to the United States. And that scale is exactly where I think the trajectory of this conversation should go, because quite frankly, our cars are getting bigger and bigger on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, take a look at Germany's favorite car, the 1981 Volkswagen Golf versus the 2023 model. For starters, the standard Golf has morphed from a two-door hatchback to a four-door hatchback. You actually can't even buy a two-door Golf any longer. And it has elongated by over half a meter. And the same is true for America's automobile darling as well. The 1981 Ford F-150 versus the most popular 2023 trim level, the Ford F-150 Platinum, which by the way, accounts for nearly 50% of Ford's F-150 sales amongst private consumers. And wouldn't you know, it has also morphed from a two-door to a four-door vehicle and has also become more elongated. But the Ford F-150 has also changed from a utility vehicle to a luxury vehicle, not just in amenities such as saddle leather and panoramic sunroofs, but in price as well. In fact, the top of the line Ford F-150 Raptor starts at a price of nearly $13,000 more than the starting price of a Porsche 718 Cayman. And yes, yes, okay, I know, I know. These are two very different vehicles that have completely different use types on paper. Because, you know, are they really all that different? I mean, in the 1980s, half of all trucks were considered small or midsize. By the 2010s though, small pickups had all but disappeared in favor of huge luxury trucks. 
trucks that today are used far more likely for hauling groceries and kids to soccer practice than construction materials or farm equipment. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather do my errand running in the Porsche than just rent a truck for the handful of times I need to actually use an open bed pickup. It'd probably be cheaper too. Okay, all right, but, but I digress because the point I'm trying to make here really doesn't boil down to cost, but just simply the idea that the vehicles that we're consuming are becoming larger and larger, and that's not really just an American phenomenon. Crossovers are the fastest growing segment in Europe, outselling traditional cars in many countries. And while you certainly won't see as many heavy duty pickup trucks and hefty land yacht SUVs over here, they do exist and their market is growing. In fact, the Volkswagen Tiguan and T-Roc are the second and third most popular vehicles in Germany, respectively. You know, I might not be a gearhead quite in the same way as my husband, but as a researcher, I found this thought experiment wildly fascinating. By value, cars are the most traded product in the world. Germany is the world's largest exporter of vehicles and the US is the biggest buyer. So I think this conversation today about just the differences in car design and really car preferences between US and German consumers was just wildly fascinating and really honestly had me thinking a lot about the kind of cars that I've bought over the years and how my preferences have changed since I've moved to Germany. And you know, if you're at all interested in continuing this conversation, well, I actually have something that I am pretty excited to share with you. In my past life, before YouTube, before even moving to Germany, my identity was as a university instructor. So I am so excited to announce that we are officially kicking off our Patreon community. Depending on which membership you choose, you not only get access to our official Discord chat room, but you can also get early access to videos, exclusive merchandise, give me feedback on content before it's published, and of course, chat with me. Because really, when I think back to my time in the classroom, it wasn't really just the content that I was producing that made me so passionate about it. It was the fact that I got to have conversations with people who were just as interested in learning about these topics as I was. So I hope you check it out and we can continue these deep dives together. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So until next time, juice.